Uh, so I'm Bradley Tyson. I'm going to talk to you about modeling and measuring crystallizing mixed diastereomer systems. So just to give you a little bit of background, diastereomers, there are a class of chiral molecules that uh, have different physical properties, such as solubility and melting point, and hence they'll crystallize differently. So if you look on the left, we have an example mixed crystallization profile. So we could have crystallization of diastereomer A, which is our wanted product. So we've tailored this to uh, crystallize as this. We could also have uh, a diastereum B in solution, which could be present due to the um, conditions in which it was synthesized. So what this can actually do is you could have at the end of the um, crystallization, two different crystals present, one for diastereum A and one for B. In some cases, you can actually form co-crystals and other effects such as nucleation inhibition and also growth modification. This gives us quite a lot of uncertainty in our final product. So what we're looking into is evaluating the chiral forms of our products. So as you can see here, we could either form a conglomerate or a racemic compound. So if we take xylose on the left, one of our components, we can see that it forms a potential conglomerate. Um, this is conducive from the evidence we've got. That it's got a lower melting point. And also the power X-ray diffraction pattern is the same as its pure enantiomers, as it only um, consists of its components. <coughs> the data shown is for our, our racemic compound of arabinase. We can see that uh, it has a higher melting point as a DSC on the right. And also it has a different powder extra diffraction because we formed a new solid state. So this is actually similar to a co-crystal. You've got both units, the D and the L, contained within one single crystal. <clears throat> if we start to think about what happens in our situation on the left, where we've got multiple components in solution, we can think that if we've got the xylose and arabinose together, we could get two crystallizing states. We could also get co-crystal formation. So we wanted to check this. So by crystallizing small vials of this, we we're able to see that for all of our mixtures, we're actually getting two crystallizing states. This is uh, referenced by the fact that we've got both peaks present in the powder X-ray diffraction. And if we were to form a co-crystal, we'd start to notice more peaks. You might also see that from the X-ray diffraction on the right at the bottom, that there is more peaks that match with the arabinose. We think this might be the fact that the xylose is being inhibited in its nucleation by the presence of the arabinose, which makes it really interesting to model. <coughs> The future work entails elucidating our chiral nature, our DR xylose on the left, as we're not sure what it is. It might be a potential conglomerate. And also measuring these nice single crystals I've been able to grow over the lockdown period while the lab wasn't disturbed. And this will help us towards the later stages of the project where we'll be able to investigate and measure rates of crystallization of these mixed systems. We're going to then use these rates to predict crystal size distributions of the different populations and also to develop a methodology to measure the particle size of the mixed systems uh, experimentally. If you do have any questions or you'd like to discuss any concept I've um, said in this talk, my email address is on screen and it's been a pleasure presenting my work to you. Thank you very much. Brilliant, thanks Bradley. Our next speaker is Dheeraj. Dheeraj, I can't hear you. I think your microphone's muted, perhaps. Hello, hello. Yes, I can hear you. Great. Ha, thank you. Can I start? We can. Ha, ha polyoxometalates are um, an ionic metal cluster which are composed of uh, early transition metal elements, and it has a wide range of range of application in catalysis and redox property, water splitting, and carbon dioxide reduction along with it. Uh, it is also showing great anti-tumor property. And uh, POM has oxophilic uh, surface, so we can modify uh, its surface by organic ligand and metal. So we can functionalize it by tuning it uh, with various metal ligands, and we can enhance its property. And polyoxometalates can be divided into three categories, isopolyanine, heteropolyanine, and molybdenum blue and brown. So we, we can we can synthesize polyoxometalates with hybrid material uh, based on uh, ionic, uh, ionic pair molecule and co covalent molecule technique. So in first work, uh, in my first work, which is on bottom left, I have used cinnamaldehyde phenyl hydrazone, which is a sieve base. Along with it, I have used copper, and uh, in the presence of polyoxometalate, it is cyclizing. It is showing great uh, in situ cyclization, which is which is very rare from cinnamaldehyde. Uh, 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 phenyl hydrazine to 1,5 uh, diphenyl pyrazole. So 
it is a it is a great example of in situ cyclization along with it it is a copper one system so we can also oxidize it from copper one to copper two by the exposure of molecular oxygen and in second work i have synthesized iron pair based molecular structure in which i have uh, we have synthesized two type of structure and the fascinating result of this work is that we have we have stabilized a free radical at room temperature and along with it i have also synthesized ndi based molecule uh, from uh, from protonation of NDI and I have stabilized it with the uh, polyoxometalates. Since polyoxometalates are anionic in nature, so uh, I, we have to protonate the organic quality. And uh, the amazing result is that we have uh, su supported by the spin trapping experiment and EPR experiment uh, and proton NMR spectra also suggested that there is a presence of the radical. So we are uh, we are we have um, communicated this result. And in the last part of this uh, work, we have we have uh, demonstrated that how polyoxometalates can and uh, uh, alter the coordination property of the ligand. In the complex one, in the bottom right part, the complex one, there is no polyxomatelets, only copper is, is uh, attached to the bidentate, the bridge bidentate ligand, that is salicylate triazo ligand. And when I added, uh, uh, when we have added polyxomatelets to the um, this compound one, and the bidentate, 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 Bidentate of the base is now converted to the monodentate ligand. Now copper is attached to the only one nitrogen, um, nitrogen atom of the triazole ligand so we can say by tuning the property of the ligand and the metal we can play with the uh, morphology or morphology or coordination chemistry of the uh, polyoxometalates cluster and uh, we are also doing some anti cancer uh, property of um, investigating the anti cancer property of these ligands so by this i would like to thank the organizer for giving me opportunity and uh, if you, you have any question kindly contact me thank you brilliant thanks neeraj our next speaker is jason Hello. Great, can hear you. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to say the word vodes a lot, um, just so you remember it. I've put my email address in the in the chat so people can uh, can can reference it if they need to. So I'm going to talk about a volatile deep eutectic solvents that we've been using. For people that don't know, a deep eutectic solvent is basically a, a liquid which sp uh, spontaneously forms when two solids are mixed. Um, normally a hydrogen, hydrogen bond donor and acceptor. Um, the famous one is choline chloride and urea, but they're inherently stable. Um, we've been making crystals from a volatile version of a deep eutectic solvent. Um, basically, one of the um, co-formers of the, of the deep eutectic is inherently volatile, and it will leave over a matter of time. So if you look at box two, you can see a timeline. The two solids become a liquid. The volatile component leaves and leaves into a crystal form. Um, what we've been able to do with this, specifically, if you look at box three, is that we've been able to control the polymorph of paracetamol. So we've been able to make form two paracetamol at room temperature and pressure. Um, we're just out of these vodes. Um, and we can also, with the um, the isomer metacetamol, we've been able to control morphology. So these vodes are giving us uh, morphological and uh, polymorphological control over these crystal forms, which is great. Um, box four is just showing a um, another interesting thing that happens from these vodes. This is harmine it makes a co-crystal as it's as it's uh, the volatile components leaving and we end up with this highly porous structure um this isn't something we see often but it's just an interesting side note so basically because we're making the solvent out of the the api or the organic compound that we're interested in it's at a very very high concentration so we're talking half a gram per mil in the liquid phase um, and because there's so there's such such high concentrations we're promoting crystallization of a kinetic product metastable polymorphs and whatnot. Um, so without a traditional solvent involved, we don't have to worry about when forming co-crystals, um, uh, solubility matching uh, to make sure they're both soluble in the same organic solvent at low amounts. Um, so in box six, you can see we take coformer A, coformer B, add the volatile component, mix them in the liquid phase, and we end up with a co-crystal of, uh, of both of them. And we've been making very very interesting co-form uh co-crystals with this method um we we ended up making large crystals of a particular agrochem uh co-crystal that that took a long time to make and we just stuck it in this vodes and out came the co-crystal that we can then fully uh fully characterize we've also made some very interesting api co-crystals um so basically because it's such a, a highly concentrated uh kinetically promoted product uh, basically, we're thinking that anything that will co-crystallize, you can co-crystallize with this VODES method. So I'm going to say VODES a few more times. 
votes. Uh, thanks, Jason. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Charlie. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Uh, can I start? <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay, so uh, afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for the opportunity to talk at this uh, Crystal Conversations. So I'm Charlie Hall. I'm a fourth year PhD student from the University of Bristol, and I'm working under the supervision of Dr. Simon Hall, who is no relation. So uh, the work that I want to highlight today involves the use of volatile deep eutectic solvents that you might have just heard about from Dr. Jason Pottigrew. Um, uh, volatile deep eutectic solvents, if you've just heard, are a medium for crystallization where you mix two components together. One of them is volatile and one of the components is the one that you're interested in crystallizing. Uh, and when you evaporate off the volatile component, you get crystals of the product that you're interested in. And by varying the ratio at which we uh, mix these two components, we have shown crystallographic control. So the work that I want to highlight uh, today is the next step in looking at the fundamentals of what's really going on in these systems. So I was fortunate enough to be able to do some experiments at the diamond synchrotron using uh, the concurrent techniques of powder X-ray diffraction and DSC, so thermal cycling analysis. So in pane three, you get, uh, I've shown the, uh, an image of some of the data that we get from this. And what we see uh, is that we get data as we cool down uh, our volatile deep eutectic solvent. And we can get both the structural information from powder X-ray diffraction, and we can get thermodynamic information from the DSC. And what we found from this is that we get a hierarchy of crystal structures that crystallize out as we cool down the system. So to start off with, uh, we tend to get our volatile component crystallize out. But then after that, we see that we get co-crystals of our volatile component and the component of interest. And what we think is that these co-crystals are mediating the crystallographic control that we get in our systems. We also think that this might be useful for understanding why deep eutectic systems form in the first place. So I want to say a few thank yous. Obviously, thank you, Jason, for, uh, for all the work he's done on this. And also, Dr. Asma Bwans, who gave us the opportunity to use the uh, Synchrotron DSC at Diamond. Uh, I've highlighted a few uh, papers we've had at the bottom here, one to do with the, uh, the formation of these co-crystals uh, and a couple of others to do with the crystallographic control that we have from the volatile deep eutectic solvents. Uh, if you have any questions about any of this, please feel free to email me. I've put my email in the middle at the top. And also, if you're interested, please follow on Twitter because uh, this that's a really good way of um, getting the information out there. And I've started enjoying, uh, especially with the Crystal Conversations, the, uh, the community. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, Charlie. Our next speaker is going to be Lorenzo. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, you can start. Yep. Right. So my name is Lorenzo and I'm working on studying the effects of the crystallization conditions on the properties of cocoa butter based olefoms using a multi-technique approach. So reducing saturated fat in food is one of the major uh, trends now because uh, saturated fat have been deemed unhealthy by several health organizations. So uh, food manufacturers are trying to reformulate their products. The problem is that saturated fat contributes significantly to the, re the rheology and stability of many popular foods, such as butter, spreads, and confectionery. So replacing them is quite challenging. One of the viable strategies that have been uh, suggested is to use olefoms, which are edible airy oil systems, uh, which can both uh, lower the amount of saturated fat and the calorific content. And this is done that by basically taking a dispersion of the fat crystals into an oil, which is called an oleogel, whip it using a, a mixer, and the air bubbles are thickly stabilized using fat crystals. Clearly, as the crystals play a very important role in this material, it's very important to study the, the link between the crystalline properties and the properties of the olefoms. So in my project, what I did was to prepare several oleogels by uh, mixing cocoa butter and sunflower oil in different ratios and using different cooling rates. And I use those techniques you see in the slide to study the materials, especially the crystalline properties. So the results were that basically the main parameter 
that affected the properties of the olefin was the amount of solid material. And this is because regardless of the cooling rate, we found that the aeration stack breaks down the cocoa butter crystals to objects of similar size. And uh, so then this thing eliminates all the differences in the crystallization conditions. We also found that um, the cocoa butter crystals at the end of the aeration, the, at the end of the crystallization and in the olefins were in the beta pipon, which is one of the uh, desired polymorphs due to their desirable properties. And you can see in the middle graph in the bottom, we have the black trace, which is a, a reference cocoa butter and beta 5, whereas the gray trace is one of my samples. And last, you can see an, a cryo SEM image of uh, all of them. You can see the inside of the bubble, and you can see that inside we have cocoa butter nanoplatelets facing towards the interface, whereas in the ologel, so bottom right, you can see that they have a different orientation. They're just poking out for the ologel. So we think that this is a further proof of their bickering uh, stabilization mechanism. And in general, all those foams incorporated twice uh, uh, the initial volume in terms of air. So they reduced the calorific content by uh, a factor of three. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorenzo. That was really good. Um, our next speaker is Shobana. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can. You're good to go. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the topic of my talk is can we predict the acyl transfer reactivity of organic molecules in the solid state? This study started with the observation of a acyl intermolecular benzyl transfer reaction in the crystals of dibenzoate 1 when it was heated with solid sodium carbonate below the melting point. So basically, a benzyl group migrates from the actual position of one molecule to the free hydroxyl group of another molecule giving the tribenzoate and the diol in almost quantitative yield. If you look at the crystal structure of one, the molecules assemble in helical fashion to OHO hydrogen bonding, which brings the electrophilic carbonyl group of an actual ester in close proximity to the nucleophilic hydroxyl group of an adjacent molecule along the helix. And studies of similar reactions in related derivatives led us to conclude that this reaction works best if the distance between the nucleophile and the electrophile is in the range of 2.9 3.3 angstrom, and the angle of approach of the nucleophile towards the electrophile lies between 84 to 90 degrees. The presence of supporting weak interactions, such as CH5 in this case, is essential for maintaining the dopochemical control of the reaction, and the presence of channels, in this case the molecular helices, are essential for the progress of the reaction through the crystal in domino fashion. So with this information in hand, we decided to look at the Cambridge Structural Database for reactive crystals. So we search for compounds which contain an extra carbonyl group and a hydroxyl group separated by distances in the range of 2.8 to 3.3 angstrom. Of the hits obtained, 200 corresponded to crystals where the angle of approach of the nucleophile towards the electrophile lay in the range of 85 to 95 degrees. From this subset, we identified a 2 into 1 co-crystal of naphthalene to see diol and its diparamethyl benzoate to test our hypothesis. The molecules in these crystals are arranged in the form of layers. So you can see that uh, in each layer, the diester molecules are sandwiched between pairs of hydrogen bonded diols, and the assembly is supported by CH5 interactions between the co-crystal formers. This assembly brings the electrophile and the nucleophile close enough for the reaction, and also helps in the propagation of the reaction through the crystal. So we felt confident that this crystal would show a cell transfer reactivity in the solid state. And when these crystals were heated with sodium carbonate, we found that paratoluene group migration occurs, yielding the dion and the monoester almost quantitatively. So this proves that we can indeed select a crystal from the database or predict the acyl transfer reactivity of an organic molecule by looking at its molecular packing and the relative orientation of the potentially reactive centers in the crystal. Thank you. And you can read more about the inostral story in this account or CJOC paper. And that's the end of my talk. Thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. And you can always write to me if you need to know more about this. Work. Thank you for listening. Brilliant. Thanks, Shavana. Uh, next, we've got Megan. Yes, hi. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Megan. I'm from Georgetown University. I'm a fourth year graduate student working under Dr. Swift. And today I'm going to tell you guys about my research cytosine monohydrate crystals under thermal and mechanical stress. Um, so, as we all know, um, hydrates are very important in the pharmaceutical industry. They occupy about one third of all drugs. 
And so understanding the dehydration processes and other phase transformations that can occur are extremely important. So we work with cytosine as a model system. Um, and in the top right box, you can see the packing diagram of the monohydrate. And then upon dehydration, you can see that it turns into the dehydrated form, which we have found to be the same form as the anhydrous phase. So we've investigated this thermal transformation via a variety of techniques. Um, in the top right, you can you can see the thermal gravimetric analysis where we studied under three isothermal temperatures um, with increasing kinetic um, mechanisms as the uh, temperature increases. And then we've also looked at this with um, a synchrotron using time-resolved powder X-ray diffraction um, at the Advanced Photon Source in Argonne National Lab, where you can see the one-step transformation from the monohydrate to the dehydrated form. So after understanding the thermal mechanism behind this uh, pure process, we wanted to look into the mechanical processes as well. So in the bottom left, um, this is some of our nano indentation experiments. So you can see the tip indenter relative to the 100, which is the major face of the crystal. And so a load unload profile um, can be seen in the top right of that box there, where we have noticed um, some pop-ins, which are, are common to be seen. But what was really interesting is that we are able to extract both the hardness and the modulus. So the hardness we found to be approximately 0.577 gigapascals, with the modulus being approximately 13.47 gigapascals. Um, and as you can see in the atomic force microscopy image too, we uh, have seen some anisotropic pile up um, after post-indent imaging that follow the crystallographic axes. And so after studying the pure system, we, we introduce dye dopants to the system to understand how molecular dopants can affect this. So thermo thermally, we have found a significant increase in the dehydration temperature through differential scanning calorimetry of two dyes that we use, which is azocarmine G and Evans Blue, which you can see incorporated into the crystals um, in the figures there. And then preliminary nano indentation experiments have shown differing mechanical properties um, with the azocarmine G showing a much deeper contact depth range than we are getting for the Evans Blue and the Pure system all under the same load of 1000 micronewtons. So these are some preliminary studies here and we, going forward we want to continue to investigate how these dye systems can help tune and engineer um, specific properties within our systems. Um, thank you so much and I'll be able to take any questions. Brilliant, thanks Megan. Uh, our final speaker is going to be Sammy. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. You're good to go. Okay. I'm Samula, currently working as a bioinformatician at National Institute of Health, NIH, Islamabad, Pakistan. And today I will talk about uh, proteome-wide analysis for potential druggable candidates against Morganella morganae. Uh, the question is, why Morganella morganae? Well, to answer this question, Morganella morganae is the WHO critical PRT pathogen candidate. It is an MDR and there is no vaccine available for Morganella morganae. So we started from here. The complete proteome of uh, Morganella morganae was removed from NCBI and the redundant sequences were removed via CD head. And the non-redundant sequences were subjected to BLAST-V against human. Human homologs were discarded and non-homologs were selected. And again, BLAST-V against a DIC database where the pathogen essential genes were selected. And these essential genes were further explored for subcellular localization, such as outer membrane, periplasmic, cytoplasmic, and cytoplasmic membrane via PSOD B, cello, and cello to go. The metabolic pathways analyzed via KIC and the virulent proteins via VFDB. The druggability assessment via drug bank 5.0 resulted GLRR, a two component response regulator protein. Unfortunately, the crystal structure of GLRR was Epson and RCSB, so we followed comparative modeling technique and model it via SFIS model and validated via PROSA and SAFE 5.0. Then we retrieved 8,044 antibacterial compound library from a Xenex, and before docking, these compounds and the receptor were prepared and docked via CCDC Gold 5.3. And the best dog complex was selected based on number of hydrogen bonds, hydrophobic interactions, and pi pi staking formation. Uh, lastly, the dynamics of the best complex was further explored at 100 nanosecond of uh, molecular dynamic simulation via Ember. The results from our simulations, such as low RMSD, RMSF, RG, and beta factor, revealed stable confirmation of the top head molecule inside the pocket of GLRR throughout the 100 nanosecond molecular dynamic simulation. 
Now, this theory further suggests that the top head molecule should be further validated in vivo and in vitro in order to find a potential drug molecule against Morganilla morganae to tackle antimicrobial dr drug resistance. Thank you. Thank you so much for allow allowing me to present my research at CCDC. Thank you.